no hay ninguna máquina en el mundo que pueda hacer hoy día todo un dispositivo con un solo alambre. Solamente son ellas, a través de ese conocimiento ancestral de los tejidos, esa dedicación, que logran hacer estas estructuras tan complejas. Mi nombre es Franz Freudental, soy médico, cardiólogo pediatra, intervencionista y me dedico a fabricar dispositivos médicos para tratar enfermedades cardíacas. Gracias a estos dispositivos podemos curar hasta un 60% de las enfermedades sin abrir el tórax. El dispositivo avanza por este catéter, llega donde está el defecto cardíaco, se reconfigura en ese lugar si es el defecto cardíaco. Yo me encontraba acá, en Bolivia. Tenía la tecnología, no tenía máquinas. Y las personas han venido hacia mí y me han pedido que estaban dispuestas a ayudarme. Las señoras que vienen donde nosotros son aymaras y llevan la capacidad de hacer el tejido en su sangre. Es 60 o 70% de los bolivianos vienen de estas personas originarias. Esto que está viendo así como una cosita larga. Estas señoras en el comienzo han sido pacientes nuestros. Hemos tenido algunos pacientes que no hemos logrado tratar, sus hijos. Les hemos explicado la solución y ellas han trabajado con nosotros. Yo me llamo Verónica Duviri Balboa. Eh, yo soy una tejedora. Mi mamá me enseñó a, a tejer desde niña. Nosotros que tejemos los dispositivos ayudan a salvar vidas. Los pequeños es como tres horas. En los grandes es un día y medio. Y también en los tejidos se requiere mucha paciencia, cariño, amor al tejido. Son más de 50 mil pacientes que hemos tratado. Es el conocimiento y la sistematización que traen los ingenieros, más la habilidad y el arte de estos artistas, es que producen estos dispositivos. Para mí es hermoso que estos tejidos ancestrales, junto con tecnología, estén salvando niños. Para mí es un milagro. My goal is to get every single single woman carrying around condoms, just as they carry around everything else. It's like a no-brainer, and I always joke like, how do we get people to take selfies with condoms? I'm Mika Hollander, and I'm the co-founder of Sustain, which is a brand of all-natural sexual wellness products marketed to women. Only 19% of single sexually active women use condoms regularly, and one in four college freshmen actually gets an STD during her first year at school. This is a crisis, and this is a subject that isn't being talked about because when you think about condoms and lubricant, these are products that can be seen as taboo. Women are extremely uncomfortable buying and carrying condoms. When I go to my peers and the people that I know, they're the worst offenders. We're trying to rebrand it a little bit and completely empower women to take control of their sexual health with much better products. Most lubricants out there contain parabens and glycerin and petroleum and silicone. Our products have none of those things. They're aloe and water based. It's the only fair trade certified carcinogen free condom on the market in the US. We are starting a conversation that needs to be had. So I spend a lot of time talking to consumers about why they not only need to be using our products, but also why they should be just using condoms in general. You should never feel ashamed for wanting to or having sex, but the reality is you're out there for you and you need to protect yourself, nobody else is going to.
C-sections are the most common major surgery performed on human beings. And over basically one generation of moms, the C-section rate has gone up by 500%. The problem is that your number one risk for having a C-section might be which hospital you go to. That's what wakes me up in the morning. I'm Neil Shah, an obstetrician over at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. I'm an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School, and I'm part of the core faculty here at Ariadne Labs. A lot of people don't realize the full magnitude of the problem with C-sections. Basically, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, C-section rates were about 5%. And then all of a sudden, the C-section rate starts to skyrocket. Not just increase, but skyrocket. So before the end of the century, when the C-section rate goes up to one in three. And we don't really have a great idea why this is happening. As a surgeon myself, it's hard to believe that one in three human beings needs a major surgery to be born, but that's sort of where we are right now. And the consequences are significant. So things like severe infection, hemorrhage, uh, organ injury, in addition to $5 billion of spending annually, we're talking something like 20,000 major avoidable surgical complications that we're seeing from C-sections we didn't need to do in the first place. I was really puzzled when I first started this job, thinking, like, what can we possibly do about this? Epidemiologists, economists, policymakers, lots of people have been thinking about this for a long time. The clue for me was the fact that across the country, C-section rates vary from 7% to 70% by hospital. If hospital performance is so uneven and it's not explained by patient risk or patient preference, that means the hospital itself could be a risk factor. All of our projects right now are actually trying to figure out what makes Hospital A different from Hospital B. What we've seen is that oftentimes the labor floor is in kind of like a almost forgotten about corner and it just doesn't get a lot of investment or attention from the hospital. When we visit a bunch of different hospitals, we realize that they're laid out very differently and that might matter. For example, there are no rules for how many labor floor rooms you should have based on the amount of patients that you see. The place that does twice as many deliveries also does way more C-sections. The only way that's possible is if they're moving people through much faster. Almost all labor floors seem really tight on resources, so the idea is when you have a huge surge in patient volume, how do you flexibly recruit more rooms? How do you bring in more staff? Do you report C-section rates? back to your doctors. Like, I have no idea what my C-section rate is until somebody tells me. You know, we're testing this hypothesis that management matters in childbirth just the way it matters in every other industry. We're starting to parse differences among C-sections. So rather than looking at all C-sections altogether, we're trying to just take the lowest risk women and focus on their C-section rate. As soon as you start to do that, two things happen. Insurance companies start to pay attention, and then just women start to pay attention. And I actually think this is an area where women's views on this are probably gonna be the driving force behind the change. There's really no other moment in people's life where they're so discerning as when they become pregnant. I think the homeless in general just feel that they've been completely forgotten by society, that nobody cares about them, nobody cares if they wake up tomorrow. They might even feel like they think that people hope that they don't wake up tomorrow. And I didn't think that anybody should have to feel like that. So I decided that when I became a PA that I wanted to focus on, on the homeless population. So street medicine is really a program that was born out of the idea that everybody matters. We see that there are certain segments of the population um, that just don't access healthcare the way everybody else does. Because Allentown is a relatively small city, it is still surrounded by woods. So most of the homeless, you're not gonna see sleeping outside on the street. So they go live in the woods and tents, so that's usually where we have to go to find our patients. I have a backpack with 
over 20 medications. We have an EKG machine. We do point of care testing where we can get different blood work. The whole idea is to deliver quality care on site in a place where the patient feels comfortable. Do you still have that inhaler, Mike? Yeah. How often are you using it? 102 over 68. 98.4. Everything we do is completely free. We provide free medications, free labs, free diagnostic studies, so they don't need insurance. And we have the same incredible people that see them all the time. They get to know us and trust us, and uh, we're lucky enough that they allow us to help them. Okay, just breathe normal. Doing this job can be extremely difficult. You just see things that are really hard to see and, and sometimes feel helpless. But one of the things that, that I always try to do is just try and completely forget myself in it. To remember that this is not about me at all, it's just about the patients. It doesn't matter if I'm tired, it doesn't matter if I'm frustrated with trying to help somebody. It just doesn't matter about me, it matters about them. So I try and focus on them and their needs. As long as prosthesis have been around, people have been really focusing on making it look like a hand and move like a hand. But a hand is not just a grabber. A hand is a touch. It's touch that engages you with the world. It's touch that engages you with people. A prosthesis without touch is a tool. By giving touch, we're giving back a hand. I worked in a factory setting before I lost my arm. I was doing some cleaning under, out from underneath a shredder type machine and um, grabbed material that was in my hand and pulled my hand into the machine. I didn't think that I'd ever have the sensation of touch or anything back again. And then my prosthetist told me about the research program up here in Cleveland. They hope to be able to give me the sense of touch. The research that we've been doing is reconnecting the man to the machine. Basically learning how to take what the prosthesis feels and translate so that the person using it feels it. For the brain to feel touch as being their actual hand, it's really important that we activate or stimulate the wires that the brain always used to get from the hand. What we do is we implant cuff electrodes and then we apply really tiny amounts of current that activate those wires and that information then goes to the brain. So we've been learning how to place this information on that nerve so the brain thinks it's his hand. They can feel not just buzzing, but also a touch, a pressure, like somebody putting a finger on their hand. And in fact, we've been able to see that intensity of the artificial stimulation mimics the intact hand. Um, soft, big block. The first time they put sensation on and everything, it was just incredible. It was like, wow, could actually feel an area in my hand, a certain area, tingling and vibrations and stuff. Small, soft block. I said, just an incredible feeling. Bringing the prosthetic home with the sensory hand on it and being able to feel and everything's changed life considerably. It's just little things that people take for granted. Brushing teeth, to be able to hold the toothpaste and be able to squeeze and tell how hard I'm squeezing it so I don't squeeze it and go every place. It makes it a lot easier. We're at the point where subjects can use their prosthesis at home. They can have sensation while they're at home. It makes them two-handed again. It brings back their hand. It makes them whole. When a patient first comes to our office, they feel a little self-conscious about the way they look, or they don't want to look people eye to eye. People always think I'm just doing this for cosmetic reasons, but actually it's the restoration of a person. I'm an ocularist. That is someone that fits and fabricates artificial eyes for people. During the surgery to remove your eye, the doctors place an implant in the muscle cone, 
so we fit a concave convex shape that sits like a contact lens on the implant. It is an art form. We do everything by hand. First, we take an impression. This gives us an imprint of the exact structures behind the eyelids. Painting is very challenging. Everything starts from a black disc, and everything is painted on top of that. It's very difficult to match the iris color. No two people have the same color. So we'll sit there with a paintbrush and we'll paint different structures, dots, dashes, striations, overlay that with different hues or different saturations of color to give it the three-dimensional effect that we see in people's natural eyes. Part of what makes it look natural is to have the sparkle in your eye. We do that with fine polishing and fine tuning the curves of the artificial eye the part I most like about fabricating a prosthesis is when I finished it and I look at it and I see the illusion that I've just created. When somebody loses their eye, sometimes they feel like they've lost part of their self-being. We make them feel whole again and confident to take on the world.